Um, it's my pleasure to provide a brief introduction for our keynote speaker this morning. Um, some of you probably heard Donovan once or twice before. Uh, he was actually a, an attendee at not one, but two of our previous conferences in Stillwater, um, way back long before I didn't have gray hair, and then also in Duluth after that a few years. So Donovan Ripkema is principal of Place Economics, a Washington DC based real estate and economic development consulting firm. Uh, Donovan has undertaken assignments for public and nonprofit sector clients in nearly every state in the United States, um, as well as quite a number of countries internationally as well. Um, he's the author of several publications, uh, and his book, The Economics of Historic Preservation, A Community Leader's Guide, um, is widely used by preservationists uh, nationwide. It's also been translated into Russian and Korean, and I can vouch for one of those people who uses it on a very regular basis. Uh, in, I have actually two copies in my office, usually because one of them is being lent out to somebody. Um, and I will also admit that I, I use the English language version, not the Korean or the Russian one. Um, let's see, sorry. Uh, in the fall of 2012, uh, Donovan was uh, awarded the Louise DuPont Crown and Shield Award uh, from the National Trust for Historic Preservation. This is an award given to the nation's uh, uh, highest preservation honoree um, and awarded for lifetime contribution. Uh, very appropriate for somebody like Mr. Ripkema um, for his work in preservation uh, in the United States. So it's my pleasure to welcome Donovan back to Minnesota and please join me in giving him a warm greeting. Uh, thank you, Michael. Uh, mostly untrue, but appreciated just the same. Uh, uh, Russ and I have, have another, uh, uh, Preservation Action is a great organization, so you do need to sign up and be a supporter and get on the board and do stuff. But we have another, uh, another connection, is that the chair of the board for whom Russ works of Preservation Action, the chair of that is Brianna Grosicki, who's, who works with me. Uh, and she's on two months of, of maternity leave, and so Russ and I are both kind of floundering around till we get Bree back to tell us what we're supposed to be doing. Uh, anyway, I, I am glad to, to be here, uh, and Michael was right. Uh, I come to every decade, whether I'm wanted or not, I show up in Minnesota and talking about the same thing. It is this kind of one-trick pony thing. Uh, so my, I have, I am now, um, I was born uh, just after uh, uh, the Civil War, and so all of those 160 years I've been talking about the, the economics of historic preservation, and, and it's, uh, it's all the same, uh, but I promise you that uh, now there are some new things uh, that I'll share with you about the economics of preservation. Uh, some of the work that we do, a lot of the work we do is analytical, and uh, Earlier this year, we released a study that we had done of the state tax credit, state historic tax credit in the state of uh, Pennsylvania. Uh, and when, when, when we were about 70% done with the project, uh, I went up to do a kind of briefing of a meeting like this that they were having in, in Harrisburg. Uh, and the next day, I got an email from a guy who said this, I enjoyed your short presentation at Preservation Pre-A. Uh, uh, the other day, it was as interesting as the topic would allow. Um, and so so uh, the next, so I put that on my Facebook. I thought, well, that's okay. And so the next day, I got from another somebody else in Pennsylvania. Well, here's what you need to do to boost it up. So I'm giving it my best shot. Um, this is going to seem like the eternal economics uh, seminar. So if you doze off in the back, I absolutely, uh, I absolutely understand about that. So a lot of what we do is, is the analysis of the impact of historic preservation. Uh, and increasingly in, in recent years, we've done that on a city level. And for, there's a, there's a, a, a phrase in, in economics called revealed preference. Uh, and I'm sure that you all wanted me to explain revealed preference in this fashion. Uh, but there's another way of doing it. Uh, and that is, we could have somebody come in here with a cart of ice cream cones, with, a, with some of them chocolate and some of them vanilla, and you'd each take one. 
While you didn't state your preference saying, oh, I like chocolate better or I like vanilla better, you revealed your preference by the fact that you took a, a vanilla or a chocolate uh, cone. Well, that's what much of our work is about. We look at the actions of the marketplace and reveal their preferences for historic districts, for historic buildings, for historic preservation. So that's lots of, of the kind of factoids that you're going to hear are the, the marketplace revealing its preference uh, for historic preservation. For about 25 years now, there have been a number of statewide studies, uh, a number of studies on the impact of historic preservation, nearly all of which were on the statewide level. Uh, and it's just in the last couple of years, four or five years, that in fact we've gotten assignments to do these impacts on a city level. Uh, and I wish I could claim, because I'm so smart and I just realized it's an untapped market, not, not it at all, it's a bunch of smart clients, and they're, they're reasoning for saying oh, we need to, to look at it is that you know so often you do a statewide study and then you take it to the mayor and the mayor says yeah well that ain't here or what happens statewide doesn't necessarily mean what's happening here and when you as Russ did in his presentation when you have a local building that everyone understands there's just a way to relate uh, to that otherwise politicians can see the direct impact in their community of preservation activities. Uh, we will never ever know as much about a community as the local people do. So it's an opportunity in these city studies to tap in to that local expertise, and then it can be put into a, content, uh, a consensus context so you can make local actions uh, reflecting kind of local priorities and be used for implementation. Uh, but as you all know, the most important thing is is that in the end, we have a weird system in the United States. It is what it is, and it's kind of uh, reflective of our political and economic history, but the protections for historic buildings, historic resources in the United States, are almost exclusively at the local level. Being listed on the National Register is a wonderful thing, and it's kind of access to using tax credits, but there is no protection being on the National Register. None, zip, zilch, nada, nothing. You could own, you privately own a National Historic Landmark and you could tear it down tomorrow were there no local protection. So that really is the kind of motivation for activists like you at the local level to say, we need to be measuring this impact at, a, at, a, at our level. Well, jumping back to those state studies, whether our firm did it or others did it, they, the kind of big four that emerged from most of, most of those studies uh, were these. Uh, the role that historic preservation plays in downtown revitalization efforts, uh, the incremental difference of heritage tourism over tourism in general, uh, the jobs and, and labor income generated simply by the process of fixing up old buildings, uh, and this impact on property values of local, excuse me, uh, historic districts. And we haven't ab abandoned those, we still look at those, and so on the jobs and household income in uh, Pennsylvania, for example, we looked at, say, what happens when you spend in the state of Pennsylvania a million dollars rehabilitating a historic building? Well, there's six and a half direct jobs, another five and a half indirect jobs, and 340,000 uh, in direct labor income. By the way, averaging means those jobs average $61,000 a year. So those are, those are real jobs. Those aren't like some goofy nothing job. They're real meaningful jobs. Uh, and spending a million dollars rehabilitating historic building in Pennsylvania ultimately generates another $800,000 uh, in economic activity in the state. So we look at the jobs. Uh, and then, but, but you could say, well, maybe a maybe million dollars in any industry has that kind of impact. So we picked the leading industries by employment uh, in the state of uh, Pennsylvania and look on the same measure, what happens if you do uh, a million dollars worth of food processing, or a million dollars worth of fabricated metals, or a million dollars worth of production of drugs and pharmaceuticals. Same output, dollar output, but historic preservation has more jobs and more labor income than any one of those other major industries in the state. So where's the real economic development? It's in historic preservation. Uh, Louisiana. A very different state from uh, from Pennsylvania uh, has a very good, as does Missouri, a very good uh, state. And by the way, so does Minnesota, but a very good state uh, tax credit. Uh, and what that m meant, that state uh, credit in Louisiana that has, as you know, a really tough economy. Well, 821 projects been done, 2.7 million. Uh, uh, 
uh, billion dollars of private sector capital investment. Now think about that. What it's doing is not sending money someplace else. The historic tax credit is inducing private capital to be invested uh, in your state. And while it goes up and down year to year in terms of money uh, number of projects, over $100 million in paychecks for men and women working in those buildings directly uh, over the last, uh, since 2003, so 16 years uh, in Louisiana. So a major economic tool. So that first one, jobs and income. Second one is this role of uh, historic preservation in downtown revitalization efforts. Now, many states have Main Street programs, and oftentimes and they have good data, and so we look at Main Street programs, but that's not the only way to look at it. Uh, Raleigh, North Carolina, state capital, vibrant city in the middle of the research triangle, four or five really internationally fine universities right there. So it's a booming downtown. Now, I have to say that kind of economically, I'm a market guy, I'm a for the marketplace, but what I really love is not the giant corporations, I like small business. And so here's a city in Raleigh where there's lots of new stuff being built, uh, and yet almost half of the small businesses that opened up in Raleigh, in fact, opened up in historic buildings. And another 20% of them in older buildings that just hadn't been designated yet. So it was, that is the market expressing their preference, revealed preference. Those small businesses said, we want to be in a historic building. This is San Antonio, uh, and the purple areas are local historic districts. The green circles of various sizes are numbers of jobs in small businesses in San Antonio. Now, it's not that every small, every firm that has, you know, five or 10 or 15 employees locates in the historic district, but there's a huge pattern of clustering in and around those historic districts. A, again, a revealed preference of the marketplace of small businesses. Uh, here is uh, Savannah, uh, one of the great historic cities in America, and about 30% of all businesses in Savannah are in historic districts, but half of small firm jobs and almost 60% of jobs at startup firms are in fact choosing to be, revealing their preference uh, to be in the historic neighborhoods. Because I have smart young people like uh, Brianna who you know, think of ways to look, we've started looking for alternative measures, and so we looked in Raleigh and we looked up at the 20 favorite restaurants, most popular restaurants on Yelp. Well, nearly half of those were in fact in historic buildings. So it's not just the food, it's not even just the service, it is the context within which that uh, dining out uh, activity takes place. And of course, we still look at uh, Main Street programs, and this is uh, Louisiana. And Louisiana's a tough state economically on, on all grounds. They've had a, a Main Street program there for about 25 years, and with almost uh, 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 700 million dollars worth of investment, in the, and more than half of that from the private sector in those mostly small towns scattered throughout Louisiana. And then this issue about uh, property values, about the impact of local historic districts on property values. Now, I've been doing this for a long time. And 20 years ago, or 25 years ago, when there would be a proposal of, the, um, of a local historic district, Often the real estate community, I come from the real estate world, so I'm not picking on real estate people, but often the real estate community say, no, nah, no, nah, we don't want that, because if you have a local historic ordinance, then there's gonna be another hoop to go through, and another hoop to go through, prima facie means it's gonna have an adverse impact on property values. Well, this is the area of preservation economics that's been looked by more people and more places and more methodologies than any other with a consistent answer. In fact, it's the opposite of that, and I'll show you some data from that. What's so interesting today is that the very same human beings who said, we don't want that local historic district is gonna hurt property values, are today saying, we don't want that local historic district, the property values are gonna go up, so my property taxes are gonna go up. Same human beings. Uh, well, here's kind of how that pattern works. Here is Savannah. Uh, they have four local historic districts, some very wealthy, some very opposite of wealthy. And here was their change in value over the period 1999 to 2014. Think about the time period, it's not an accident. You had a period in the 90s into the early 2000s where real estate was going up at kind of lunatic rates, and then a big real estate crash, and then depending on the part of the country, a gradual re recovery, every one of the local historic districts outperformed the city as a whole over that up, down, and back up uh, pattern. Here is uh, uh, San Antonio. And San Antonio, I don't know uh, how you have it here in St. Cloud or in other uh, cities in Minnesota, but they have in San Antonio kind of traditional historic districts. 
They have a version that's called a conservation district. Some preservationists are kind of critical of it, calling it preservation light. I've kind of changed my mind on them. I think that they're appropriate tool uh, in some instances when maybe it's not the uh, architectural character that matters, but more the context, but whatever. They've decided in San Antonio to have conservation districts and the rest of the city, which over that same, virtually the same 15 year up, down and up period, which property values did the best? The ones in the local historic districts, which did the second best? The one in the conservation districts, both of whom outperformed the city as a whole. Here is Saratoga Springs, New York, smaller community, um, half the size of a St. Cloud, um, but with a very rich history and, a, and not an inconsiderable amount of wealth. Um, and for those of you, 90% of you can say, yeah, don't tell me about that, I don't want to think about it, but for those of you who are math people, the difference between the mean and the median. The mean is the average, you add everything up and divide by the number, that's the mean. The median is a sp spread out a sample of numbers from the smallest to the largest, and what's the midpoint? Well, because in Saratoga Springs, there's some really, really, really expensive properties at the high end, that can come sometimes skew the average. Uh, so we looked in both mean and median in every local historic district, and the answer is in whether you use the mean or the median, historic districts did better uh, than did uh, the rest of the city. And then there's this issue about heritage tourism. Now I want to be candid about this. I believe in heritage tourism. I think it's good. But my goal in life, and it better happen soon because I'm really old, my goal in life is that when you say the words historic preservation and economics in one sentence, that the default response is, oh, you must mean heritage tourism. Yes, it's a piece of it. It's just not the whole piece, but it's an important piece. So this is, uh, again, San Antonio. Uh, Alamo, but uh, maybe even more important, in the two years ago, UNESCO put the missions of San Antonio on the World Heritage List. Uh, and we looked at both day visitors and overnight visitors to San Antonio. By the way, uh, this is a little bonus on the side, about 60% of a visitor's dollars are gonna be spent in the place he or she stays overnight. So you really like to have the, the overnight visitor as opposed to just day visitor. But uh, there was, so there was uh, over half, almost 60% of the overnight visitors who fell in the heritage visitor category, almost half of the day visitors. Uh, but when you're a tourist, you spend virtually all the money in five categories. Food and beverage, lodging, local transportation, these analyses, they don't count like airplane tickets because that goes to Atlanta or Charlotte or someplace else. But local transportation, the bus, the cab, the rental car, the Uber, whatever. Uh, local retail purchases and the category that's admissions, entertainment, amusements, whatever. Well, not only do heritage visitors spend more in total, in every one of the categories. The heritage-based visitors spend more locally than do visitors who come and say, yeah, I don't care about that old building stuff. Um, it was, it was this, this, this uh, wonderful organ piece that we heard. I was wanting to stand up and say, hey, I'll, I'll, I'll skip mine. I want to hear another 45 minutes of that stuff. Um, <laughs> but in the, in the kind of academic side of uh, historic preservation, there's this concept, concept of the tangible heritage, stuff we can touch, like this wonderful building, but there's things like the, called intangible heritage. Uh, and like that wonderful music. And what occurred to me as I was listening to that wonderful piece was that it is the tangible heritage of this fabulous cathedral that in fact enhances the quality of the intangible heritage of that music. Well, one of the big music capitals in America, the music capital is Nashville, of course. Uh, and we finished a, a study of, uh, in Nashville a, a couple of months ago and there was this extraordinary, we didn't know about, it, but they had fabulous tourism data that we sorted and resorted and looked at, this incredible connection between the tangible heritage of the built history in Nashville and the intangible heritage of the music. That, that heritage visitors uh, uh, were more likely to go to music venues um, they were more likely to go to multiple events, that music was a greater motivator for them to visit the city, much more so than people who went to Nashville and said, yeah, I don't care about the heritage stuff. Well, they didn't care about the music stuff either. It was this extraordinary connection between the tangible and intangible in Nashville. 
Uh, and just the and tourism, you know, huge in Nashville. And it's become a place where, where uh, uh, brides-to-be have their bachelorette party. They're going to marry some stupid guy, and so they want some wild last fling. And they go to get six of their friends and go to Nashville to do it. Uh, so there's a lot of tourism industry, but the heritage-based tourism uh, is all responsible. The heritage portion of it, almost 20,000 jobs and over a half a billion dollars in direct paychecks in Nashville from heritage-based tourism to the city. Some of you are involved in historic sites. We did a statewide study in Utah a few years ago, and of course you have Salt Lake City and lots of of visitation there and historic sites there, but there's lots of stuff across the big state of, of Utah, uh, historic sites in small places. And here's what we discovered. Often those small places, it was the historic sites in those places that drew the visitors, but it was not the historic sites that benefited the most economically from that visitation. In fact, they only got about 7% of that visitor's money Historic site was the magnet that got them there. But 93% of that visitor's money went to the gas station, went to the restaurant, went to the motel. Uh, and I know many of you face this. Maybe you have a small house museum or something, or a small historic site, and you're going to the city council and say, hey, can you help us out with the light bill? And they say, you guys' admissions need enough to pay your operating costs. Why should we give you any money? Well, this is the reason. It's kind of like when Target puts on, sells, uh, uh, toasters for less than they paid for them. It's called a loss leader. Well, it's not to lose money on the toasters, it's to get us into the Target store to buy other stuff. That's what's happening here. These historic sites, in fact, are drawing people, but the rest of the community, in fact, is by far the biggest beneficiary. Well, so those were the big, big four. Jobs and household income, downtown revitalization, property values, and, and, uh, uh, and historic districts, and heritage tourism. But as we've moved to this lower level, there's kind of a whole new list of things uh, that we found that we could look at, attributable to uh, big data in GIS and smart young people. Uh, and so I want to just share some of these. Here we had this once in three generations financial crisis in America, where millions and millions and millions of people lost everything because they lost their house to foreclosure. Huge pattern. So now we've looked, I don't know, 30 or 35 cities at foreclosure patterns uh, in historic districts. So here was five cities in uh, Utah. In every instance, the foreclosure rate in the historic district decidedly less than it was in the rest of the city. Uh, here's the city in Raleigh, where almost one household in 10 faced foreclosure action in the depths of the real estate recession. The National Register districts, half of that. Local historic districts, half of that. Now, it's not that anybody in a, who lives in a historic district never gets fired or never gets divorced or never runs up their credit card bill too much. I think what's happening is if I get myself in financial trouble, even in down markets, there's enough of a latent market for that property that I can get it sold before it goes into foreclosure. Somebody ought to be paying attention. HUD, the National Bankers Association, the National Association of Realtors, huge difference happening in historic districts than in the rest of cities. Uh, here is San Antonio. Every one of their, and some of these are very wealthy. Some of them are not wealthy at all. It didn't matter. And by the way, household income is not the variable in this one. It's not that, oh, it's all rich people in those districts. That ain't the case. Uh, every single one of the districts, in fact, had lower rates of foreclosure uh, than did the city as a whole. And then related to that is what happens when markets are going up? What happens when markets are going down? Uh, this, again, is Savannah. And the uh, blue line is with a change in value in historic districts. The yellow line is what happened to the rest of the city. So here you have this period in the up years, uh, 1999 to 2008, the real estate recession started at the end of 2007, uh, where the, in fact the, the historic properties did better than the rest of the city. And then here's what happened to the down market. The decline started later, it was less steep, it recovered sooner. So on the up market, historic properties do better. In the down market, they do less worse. And then there's this issue of density. Density is a weird thing because community development directors say we need density. The infrastructure people will say we need density. Public health people say we need density. A whole bunch of people say we want density. Everybody will say it except citizens will say, I don't want that stupid density stuff. I want a density had moved to New York. Okay, just, I want you to just chill for a moment on that. 
So here's Indianapolis, not far from here. We looked at the density of the city as a whole and density in historic districts. So the density is a third greater in the historic districts. Uh, here is the city of Raleigh. At the beginning of the 20th century, they had a density of about 8,000 people per square mile. That, with the expansion of the city, suburbanization, automobile, that dropped to about, by 1960, to about uh, 2,800 uh, people per uh, square mile, and that's about where it stayed. Look at the historic districts. 5,400 people, twice the rate of density. But here's what's important. When you do like visual preference stuff, you have a community group this side, and you show them a bunch of pictures. What kind of neighborhood do you like? They'll invariably say, I, I like that one, and that'll be the historic neighborhood. Now, it doesn't mean they want to necessarily live in the historic neighborhood, but it means they want a neighborhood of that kind of scale and character and quality. Well, those are the densest neighborhoods. It's this illusion that the only way you get density is build 40-story condominiums. Well, it's not the case. I come from the side of the political spectrum that says we ought to be try to be prudent with taxpayers money at whatever level of government so when we were doing the study in raleigh i told brie my colleague i said i want you to find me two neighborhoods the only thing i care about is one that they're the same size geographically and two that one's a newer neighborhood and one's a historic neighborhood that's that's the only thing i care about and we'll make the comparisons between the two so she found these two oakwood uh, uh, historic neighborhood and Reedham Oaks Wyndham, which is a relatively new subdivision. Uh, population 1,700 in the historic district, 500 in the new subdivision. Both of them 114 acres. Uh, housing units about 800 versus 127. Average age 1925 versus 1992. So you got it, right? There's the kind of comparison. So we started then making the comparisons. Now the average size of the dwelling, 2,500 square feet in the historic district, about 35 in the new subdivision. That's okay. Okay, it's fine. You know, people some want bigger houses. No, nope, no problem. Average value three hundred fifteen thousand to five hundred twenty-four thousand. And this is where the city finance guy reaches a premature conclusion. He says, "Yeah, yeah, that's why we want those new subdivisions because the the values are so much higher, and that's going to have a property tax impact." Okay, just chill for a minute. Uh, taxes per unit twenty-eight hundred, twenty-nine hundred versus forty-eight hundred. Now he gets all excited. Say, "Yeah, yeah, yeah. See what I'm telling you?" Okay. Population per acre. 14 and a half versus four and a half. Now, I don't care if the developer originally laid the, the roads or not, but that is the maintenance of those roads is a cost that's permanently going to be a cost that the public, public has to bear. It's a taxpayer cost. So we calculated the square foot of road per unit. Well, about 1,000 in the historic district, about 2,200. Uh, the taxes per acre, 22,000 versus 5,000. Sooner or later, we're going to have to replace water and sewer lines. 8,800 cost per unit replacement cost in the historic district, 25,000 in the new subdivision. And annual property taxes, 2.3 million versus 610,000. Who is the fiscally responsible contributor to the city of Raleigh? And then this whole issue about uh, walkability. You probably all know this, but you can go on the computer and you know, go to walkscore.com and type in any address in America, and it'll give you a walk score from 1 to 100. The higher the walk score, uh, the more walkable it is. And again, a whole bunch of people are starting to say how important this walkability is uh, to neighborhoods. So here is Raleigh. Raleigh, again, as a whole, is a, gets a walk score of 29, a very car-dependent environment. Local historic districts, walk score of 82. Uh, here is uh, Nashville. Every one of the historic districts, every one of them, has a higher walk score than does the city as a whole. Uh, and then this, this area of, of knowledge workers and creative class workers. Some of you are familiar with uh, Richard Florida, I uh, was written the, the, the creative class stuff, and he's a guy that I think is about 70% brilliant and 30% head in a dark place, but he's interesting stuff. Uh, but we've tried to kind of expand the, the, the thing from creative workers, but also kind of knowledge workers. What is the revealed preference of those kind of workers and the employees that, that put them to work? So again, here is a Savannah. 30% of all jobs in the historic district, but in these knowledge worker jobs, public administration, educational services, uh, arts, you know, creative class, uh, arts entertainment, and, and uh, 
uh, recreation, uh, professional technical services, in fact, greater preference to be in historic district than the market as a whole. Here's New York City. And you can like New York or you can hate New York, but nobody can argue it's not one of the most creative places in the world. Well, historic districts in the city of New York uh, house 8% of all the jobs, 20% of the jobs in arts, entertainment, and uh, recreation are the kind of creative class categories are in fact in historic districts. Then this issue, you know, I spent lots of my time in kind of downtown revitalization stuff, and I'm a small business person, so I, I care about this stuff. The federal government does some stuff well, some stuff not so well, but one of the things they do great is keep track of numbers. And one of the numbers that they keep track of is the ratio between business every year between businesses that open and businesses that close. Okay? Uh, and over the long haul, that ratio tends to be something between 1.1 and 1.2 to 1. That is 11 or 12 businesses opening for every 10 that close. So now we've looked at that. And here is the, the US numbers from 2004 to 2011. So kind of before, during, and after the, the big recession. So in those early years, the, the, the ratios were about the same, 1.2, 1.3, and 2, 4, 5, 6, and 7. And then 2008, 2009, 2010, the depth of the recession, in fact, more businesses closed and opened, an indicator of that recession. And then by 2011, kind of creeping back up to the norm. That's the national pattern. Well, now we've looked at uh, four or five Main Street programs, state Main Street programs, and looked at the open and close ratio in those communities. Now, for those of you who don't know, Main Street is downtown revitalization in the context of historic preservation. That's what it is. It's historic preservation-based economic development. Michigan, New Mexico, North Carolina. Decidedly different economies, every one of them blown away, blown away, this open to close ratio uh, than did the national economy. So it's not just they're fluctuating like the national economy does, they're doing extraordinarily different and better uh, than the economy is doing. Uh, and then, again, in this kind of small business thing, this is my deal, uh, in New York City, and New York City is an expensive place to be, 3.4% of the developable land in New York City is in historic districts. The real estate industry there, and I come from the real estate industry, so I'm not picking on them, but they're whining, we gotta loosen those historic districts because we can't you know, build more density, blah, blah, blah. Well, you got 97% of the land to do something on without destroying the historic districts, 3.5% of the land area, 8% of the jobs, but 10% of the small firm jobs, 10% of the startup firms, 11% uh, of young firms, in fact, choose to be, reveal their preference to be in historic districts. Here is Nashville again. Uh, if you haven't read about Nashville, it's one of the booming economies in the country. It's really going gangbusters. And, you know, you drive downtown, there's 40, literally 40 cranes you see building high rises. 3% uh, of all the jobs, but 11% of the job growth in historic districts, 13% of the startup jobs, 15% of the small business jobs choose to be, in the vibrant economy, choose to be in historic districts. 135% uh, uh, increase in jobs in the information sector, 40% of the job growth, 40% uh, job growth in historic district versus 9% in the rest of the city. So revealing a preference of small and startup businesses to be in those places. You're under no obligation to agree with our kind of philosophical position here. You can view it differently. But we happen to think that healthy cities at the neighborhood level have a demographic distribution that's a kind of mirror of the city. We just think that's a healthy thing, that you have economic integration at the neighborhood level. So we've looked at that in lots of places. So here is San Antonio by income level. And the orange line is historic districts. The blue is the, is the uh, income distribution of the city as a whole. Now, for those of you who are used to looking at charts and graphs, they're largely the same line. The difference is there's a greater share of both the poorest households and the richest who choose to live in historic districts. Well, I think that's actually a healthy thing for rich people living next to poor people. Good for both of them to live, in fact, in the same neighborhood level. Uh, here is San Antonio. And again, it's by race. Uh, and virtually the same, uh, you know, set of numbers. You know, it's a little different, but not statistically significantly different. The trouble is, 
It's about race, but there's a very small share of the San Antonio uh, population that's African-American, about 6%, but the same amount in both categories, but just not statistically very big. What is big is the Latino population, and there it is, that virtually the same share of who lives in the city of San Antonio is who lives in historic districts in San Antonio. So this illusion that, well, that historic preservation stuff might be nice, but that's for the rich white guys, well, it's just, it's just simply not the case. Uh, here is uh, Nashville, uh, again, with kind of booming economy, and Nashville's median household income is about $68,000, so we divided income categories into thirds, 50,000 and under, 50,000 to 100, 100 and more. Well, about a third of each of those categories is, in fact, who lives in historic districts. Uh, by race, there's a little skew in Nashville. It is more white uh, than the city as a whole, but in fact, sizable portions, sizable numbers, a third of the local historic districts, in fact, have a greater African-American presence in the historic district uh, than in the city as a whole. And then the environment, one of the newer areas of, of looking at the contributions of historic resources. If you haven't checked this out, you need to. A few years ago, the National Trust established this Preservation Green Lab, uh, and they did a very robust, peer-reviewed analysis, and their modeling was, let's take three building, different building typologies, put them in three different climates in the United States, and look at the environmental differences, energy use differences, uh, in rehabilitating and upgrading and the senator said we need to upgrade them. Well, that's right, you do. Upgraded uh, historic buildings or building a new green gizmo, 14 lead gold star or whatever it is. What are the differences uh, in making those two decisions? Well, first of all, they found that it took, took up to 80 years for those green gizmo buildings to recover the energy that it spent making the stupid gizmos. That in fact, in every building typology, in every region of the country. The more environmentally responsible was, in fact, rehabbing the existing building, not building the green gizmo. Uh, in Maryland, a, a investment banker guy who'd done some preservation analysis before teamed up with environmental uh, economists. And they looked at environmental measures of, again, two choices. They have a state tax credit in Maryland, like you do in Minnesota. And so their model was this. We need a 50,000 square foot warehouse. And our choices are we can take an existing warehouse and bring it up to speed or, you know, environmentally, whatever, restore it like it needs to be done, or we can go at the edge of town and build a new 50,000 square foot warehouse. When we're done, we have the same utility of the two buildings. What are the environmental differences between those two decisions? Well, a 20 to 40 percent reduction in vehicle miles traveled, a reduction of CO2 emissions, uh, embodied energy, the energy that's already in an existing building. Uh, of 55,000 million uh, BTUs. The Greenfield land preserved 5.2 acres. Uh, less construction debris of 2,500 tons and infrastructure investment saved that you don't have to make of uh, between 500 and $800,000. Russ mentioned about the bipartisan support for historic preservation. Well, I'm telling you, the Sierra Club and the Tea Party ought to be holding hands leading the preservation parade whether your primary uh, concern is the environment or kind of fiscal expenditures, I'm telling you it's historic preservation that's doing both of those things. Uh, Bloomberg, the mayor of New York, uh, decided before he left office he wanted to put New York City on the path to be the most environmentally responsible city in the world. And so good businessman that he is, he said, well, first of all, we've got to figure out who's using the energy. And so he mandated this giant energy audit of tens of thousands of buildings. Wasn't having anything to do with historic preservation. He just wanted to say, who's spending the energy? Well, lo and behold, in fact, the contrary to what the green gizmo environmentalists have been telling us, oh, you got to get rid of all those old buildings. They're just energy hogs and wind tunnels. No, in fact, every decade that went up, the buildings used more energy per square foot, not less. The ones that were the least consumptive of energy, in fact, were the oldest uh, of the buildings. In Utah, uh, again, where they have a state tax credit, we looked at the impact on the uh, landfill uh, of the choice between using the tax credit and rehabilitating a, a modestly sized house. The average house they rehabbed in, in Utah was about uh, 2,300, 2,200 square feet. Uh, 
as opposed to let's just tear that thing down, throw it away and build something new. Uh, the choice to save that house instead of throw it away meant a difference of 116 tons of stuff not going into the landfill. Um, I don't know how many towns in Minnesota this might apply to. Maybe St. Cloud. Um, but there's lots of cities in the United States that have been losing population for uh, decades. And I was very curious about when that turns the corner. When those cities start growing again, where does that growth first take place? Well, here's Philadelphia. I don't know Philly well. I teach a class at Penn every Tuesdays in the spring, so I take the train up Tuesday morning and teach for three hours and go home. So I read the Philadelphia News, and I remember when the 2010 census came out. Big headlines, we finally turned the corner. 50 years after, you know, of declining population, we finally started growing again. Not much, only 8,500 people, but we're finally growing, except they weren't. The historic districts in Philadelphia grew by 12,000 uh, uh, 12, people. The rest of the city still lost population. Washington, D.C., where I live, again, a city that had lost population for 50 years, started growing between 2000 and 2010. About 46 of us, percent of us who live in Washington live in historic districts, but that's what 60% of the growth took place in those districts. And then Boston which turned the corner a decade earlier. They started, after periods of decline, started growing. Uh, they turned the corner a decade earlier. 23% of that population lives in historic districts, but that's where 36% of the population grow. So I, what I try to tell mayors and city council members and legislators, uh, if your town is declining in size and you want to be growing again, for God's sake, don't be tearing down the first places that people want to come back to, and that's your local historic neighborhoods. Then this issue about historic preservation as catalyst. Uh, we've, in a number of contexts, we've now looked at that, and one of those was for the National Trust, looking at the use of the federal tax credit and how those projects catalyzed additional activity. So here's a wonderful project in inner city Baltimore. Uh, again, a city that's been losing population for years. This project was completed using the tax credit. It spurred additional building permits in the immediate area, and it was a, a, a neighborhood that grew in population with the rest of the city still declining. Uh, we have a client, a private sector client, who packages preservation easements. They're based in Cleveland, uh, but they did a concentrated uh, project in uh, uh, Columbia, South Carolina, on the block, just to the blocks just to north of the Capitol building that really hadn't seen anything. They were involved in 11 projects and huge differences in property values, tax collections, population, uh, revenue from uh, sales and business taxes, kind of any way that could be measured. In fact, that little compound area made a huge difference catalyzed by the uh, historic preservation projects taking place. Uh, here is back, by the way, back to um, uh, Louisiana, and again, I don't know the numbers in, um, in Minnesota, uh, although there's been great work done every year tracking your state tax credit. Um, but sometimes, you know, the headline projects are the big multi-million dollar projects, and that's fine. But in Louisiana, in fact, half of the projects were projects of less than $500,000. These were really kind of mom and pop um, um, in, in city programs. And here's what happens in Louisiana. So the state has a, was a 25, now is a 20% tax credit. So the state puts up $100,000 in credit, and that means that there's $400,000 that the private sector has to put in, in in their netted out, in their investment dollars. But what we found was that the, the amount that got the tax credit was not at all the whole expenditure. That developer had to spend a bunch of money beyond the, what was eligible for the tax credit. That's because maybe had, there was an addition, maybe other expenditures that weren't eligible for the tax credit. But it doesn't stop with that 400000 another 100000 meant. And those two uh, activities generated another $376,000 of additional stuff. So that $100,000 tax credit is not generating 400000 of investment. They're generating almost 800000 in additional investment. Uh, uh, Rusk, who was a leader on keeping the tax credits, can certainly confirm this, but all of the arguments, all of the arguments for keeping the federal tax credit in the tax law, lots of good arguments, boil down to this. 
in that uh, David Listigan at Rutgers has kept track over the years of how much the federal treasury gets back from the, every dollar they put out in that historic tax credit. Now, you can be a conservative Republican or a liberal Democrat or anything in between, and when you have a federal government program that pays the federal treasury more than it costs the federal treasury, that'd be really stupid to get rid of. Well, and that's what the federal tax credit has done, paid back to the treasury about $1.18 for every dollar uh, that it costs. Some now say, well, it's been around for the first version since 1976, and so maybe that we're done now. Maybe we've done all the historic preservation we need to do. Well, if you look at all the buildings that are today eligible for the tax credit, looked at all of them that have been done since 1976, uh, that's 13% of the buildings. Even if we never added another building on the National Register, that means we currently have buildings for 211 more years of tax credit work to do. So are we done? Not close to being done. Uh, with that, thank you very much, and I look forward to talking to you later in the conference. Thanks very much. Yeah. Questions, comments, alternative views, or go back to Washington, you communist, any of those are perfectly all right. <laughs> yeah. Can you please explain what is the preservation of easement? Preservation of easement? Yeah, yes, what, what, what is it? Okay, uh, great, thank you for the question. Uh, preservation easement uh, is, a, is an, encumbrance, an encumbrance on a property, like any other kind of easement. You give an easement for the power company to run the power line or for your neighbor to get across your land to get to, to her property. Uh, it's a, it's a, a chain of title limitation on the property. There is a provision in the federal tax law that if you give a preservation easement, and that base, if, if, let's just take this church. If this church were to give a preservation easement, then both the church and any subsequent owners of the church would have to maintain the standards that are spelled out in that easement. Would be a pre, uh, precluding demolition, would be there would some uh, uh, design requirements on what's done. There is the easement donor. Let's just pretend for a minute that this weren't owned by the Catholic Church, but were owned by some private owner. Uh, I could give an easement, but there has to be an easement holding organization. Uh, it might be a nonprofit, it could be city government, it could be state government, it could be the National Trust, somebody's willing to take the easement. Well, now you have kind of separated, just like your, your uh, neighbor for whom you gave an access easement across your land, you can't just one day say, oh, I changed my mind and put up a fence. No, he or she has an inherent right in chain of title to use that. You can't arbitrarily close that. Well, that's what a preservation easement is. Once that's been given, uh, in fact, that property can be protected in how the, the requirements will be spelled out. And for example, changes, major changes, would have to be approved by the easement holding organization. Under federal tax law, if, if a preservation easement is given in perpetuity, there is a tax deduction in the amount of the loss in value of the property. That the property unencumbered by an easement was worth X, but now I've given away one of my sticks and my bundle of rights, and so now I can't tear it down, I can't make change without approvals. So that reduces the value, and you'd have to have an appraiser who knows what she's doing to do the appraisal. And if that, say, the property is worth a million dollars, but now subject to the easement, it's only worth $800,000, I can take a, and I give her the easement, I can ten, take then a deduction of $200,000 for the donation of the easement. Now, it is a, actually a stronger tool than a local preservation ordinance uh, because we could have design controls and prohibition against demolition, other things in a local preservation ordinance, but we could have lunatics all elected to city council, and believe it or not, that's happened in some places, um, and say, oh, we're going to change that ordinance, we're going to abolish all that, then the protections disappear. But when it's in the chain of title, you can't do that. It just is there like your neighbor's uh, access easement. So it's a protective tool um, uh, for historic properties. I have to say that I, I, I've changed my mind on them. I didn't used to be a big fan of them. And I do think that perpetuity is quite a long time. So I think Congress could maybe th think maybe, I don't care what the number is, 50 years, 90 years, some others, less than forever. Um, it ought to be changed. But um, uh, it, it is a tool and is a very strong tool for protecting historic properties.
Where do you get the list of these organizations that will assure the easement? Oh, a, a good, good question, and I don't know that there is a, a, a comprehensive list. Usually they're handled, usually, not always, usually they're handled by either a city or a state um, uh, preservation advocacy nonprofit. Uh, in Ohio, Preservation Ohio, the statewide advocacy group, holds a bunch of easements. Uh, in Asheville, North Carolina, there's the uh, Buncombe County Preservation, whatever, uh, and they hold uh, local easements. The National Trust used to own, uh, hold easements. It kind of went out of the business. Um, but there, but also public entities. So a city or a state government could hold an easement on a preservation property. A lot of your numbers pertain to big cities across the country. Do your numbers work as well in small towns? Yeah, it's, and, and I'll give the most candid answer that I can. Uh, is that uh, it's it's expensive to do this stuff. So we not we're not cheap, and so it's at smaller places usually say I don't know where we'd come up with a budget to do that kind of stuff. Um, having said that, one one of the reasons we were really eager to take on this assignment uh, uh, last year in Saratoga Springs, a town of thirty thousand people, um, we look forward to that. What we have done in um, in both tax credit studies and Main Street studies uh, and some state impact studies is included data from small towns in that. And so the data will tend to be reinforcing, uh, but in terms of having this really comprehensive look on you know, 22 different variables like we have in San Antonio or New York or you know, Raleigh, it just, we, we haven't done that. Um, some of them, I think, will be less pronounced in smaller places than in large cities. Uh, but things like the jobs won't make any difference. Uh, the expenditure patterns of uh, heritage tourists won't be different. I think where, where it might be, and I grew up in Rapid City, South Dakota, so a town this size, St. Cloud, um, in a, in a, and then you know, lots of towns smaller than that. I think that issues that are really important, I think, in in uh, larger cities, like this issue of, of economic integration on the neighborhood level, that in smaller places, it's already true that just the sheer size, if you only have 8,000 people living in town, there are rich people living next to poor people. So I think that, that the distinction among historic districts will probably be less pronounced there. Uh, but my guess is that in most of the measures, it will still be true, it's just the magnitude of the difference probably not as significant. That's my guess. I, I come from a small town, and so it's a, sort of a, 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 a testament to what you're saying. We established an historic district for our downtown commercial district about 25 years ago. What town, by the way? Excelsior. Uh huh. Okay. And our, uh, we just had one building that's a sort of a landmark building. Uh, and that 25 years has gone from a tax value of approximately uh, 180,000 to approximately 1.5 million. Same, same place. However, the issue that we're having is now that we're a booming little historic district, all the baby boomers are coming into our residential district to tear down these crappy old houses and build a nice baby boomer house. Yeah. And we're having a really tough time at that. So what advice would you give us for our residential district? We uh, have attempted to try to make it historic and the issue has been that because we're so old, there's not a particular historic period. And uh, at the rate we're going, a third of our houses will be torn down in the next five years. So we need some help. What advice? Well, um, uh, this is, and here's what, here's what those buildings are as you describe them. They're really parasite buildings. They're going into a neighborhood that has the character and quality that they want by what the rest of the neighborhood likes. There's sidewalks there, they're close to downtown. They're making those choices, but they're doing it at the expense of, as opposed to enhancing the, the, their context. Uh, and, and it has then a, a, a rapid impact on when one happens, another one will happen. Uh, both uh, historic districts and um, Conservation districts can be a mitigator of that. But the fact that, you know, you, you, I'll tell you, because I've just been at it for all, you know, ever, you can, take, you can take me to the richest 
most prosperous residential historic district in America. And I'll tell you, when that district began, it was full of vacancy and fall, falling down houses. So this idea that, well, it's old stuff and we can't fix it, and so we just got to tear it down just as just sheer utter nonsense, demonstrable nonsense. The second thing, and I don't know if Excelsior have the problem, but if you don't, you're one of the few towns in America that doesn't. And that's this issue about affordable housing. We need housing that people can afford, and there's fewer and fewer towns, in fact, that have it. This is the only useful thing that you can, you'll hear from me all day. You cannot build new and rent or sell cheap. Cannot be done. Cannot be done. Unless you have deep, deep subsidies or you build crap. Can't be done. We are currently just finishing up a, a different study in uh, San Antonio that we're calling our old stuff study. And we aren't much worrying about if it's an historic district or not. We're just saying, what is the housing stock built prior to 1960 in San Antonio? And it's to look at how many there are, you know, what's the inventory of that, and how much of that housing is occupied by people of modest incomes. Because here's what's happened. 100, there's not very many things in the world that are 100% certain. I'll give you this one. 100% of the time, when an older house is torn down and something new is built, it will be less affordable than, than we're lost. So we're simultaneously tearing down what's affordable and building what's not. So I think that the strategy has to be in, in a kind of combination of things, both that there is a care, and, and you know what? You can define your, you don't have to go by some architectural historians saying, oh, this is the, you know, 16.2 years of, you know, significance of the neighborhood. You're, it's your local ordinance, you can define it however you want to. Uh, and say this is our historic district, this is the character that we're trying to, uh, trying to protect. But I think in cases like that, and particularly when it's more vernacular housing, you need to have this kind of twofold approach, saying that we're doing it for the historic character of the neighborhood, but we're also doing to make sure that the, the and, and we're not talking about unemployed people starving on the street, we're talking about the teacher, the fireman, the clerk at the bank, people who need affordable housing, and that housing is being lost when uh, that housing is torn down. Here's another for what it's worth. The National Association of Realtors does every year, they do a generational study of buyers, who bought houses. And the last study that I looked at, uh, that 34% of all buyers were millennials, 34%, 44% of all buyers of housing built between 1920 and 1960 were millennials, and 59% of all buyers of houses built 1920 and earlier were millennials. So this idea that, oh, well, that historic preservation, that's for old guys like you with gray hair and beards, but young people don't want that, just demonstrably not true. And they're buying it, and I'll wager my exorbitant day's pay, it's gonna be true in Excelsior as well, that that neighborhood, their appeal to the neighborhood because of the three C's, the character of the neighborhood, the convenience to get to stuff when you live in that neighborhood, uh, and the cost. And those three C's are driving young people who we need in our economies uh, to those older neighborhoods, so we need to save them for, you know. Th this year, by the way, 2019 is the year when there are more millennials than there are baby boomers. We're all dying. They're growing. And so we got to, if we're going to have local economies growing, we got to figure out how to millennials, and they have a revealed preference to be in the neighborhood you described. They're great. But what we're going to up against is developers, who it's a heck of a lot more money to tear down a $350,000, we're literally having that, $350,000 from existing home, tear it down and build a new one, and sell it for a million. And they're the ones that are constantly before the city council and talking about the property rights of people who have been living here for a long time, this is their retirement, those kinds of things. So I'm looking for some real, you know, not the philosophical, not the disagreement, but the practical, how in the world, what tools can we have uh, that you're aware of to help us? Well, the, uh, the, I mean, the, they're, they're finite. I mean, you need, to have the, on the, you need to have both carrots and sticks, and the sticks in that regard are uh, either historic district, conservation district, you could have an extremely expensive demolition permit. Um, uh, and then you need to have uh, on the incentive side. 
Uh, what incentives can we make so it becomes a rational act to do it? But I don't know why we've come to the conclusion that, that towns belong to developers. Why is, why is that? Why is that? And this, this issue about property rights, no, everybody talks about property rights. Who, and I'm a big property rights advocate. But who's talking about property responsibilities? We've got responsibilities to that neighbors, to the other people in that neighborhood, to young people coming in, to people who, you know, who built the place. Where's the, where's the responsibility a part of that whole discussion? And I think that has to be talked about. But, but the, this whole issue about property rights, property rights never in the United States, never have meant everybody can do whatever they damn well please. It's never meant that. But it's been skewed, so that's the argument. Well, it's just it's simply historically not true. Not in American history, that's not been the case. And we have to kind of quit letting people get away with that argument. Time for one last one. Okay, see you later. Thanks very much.